I don't know. I'm so sick of talking. I've only just started. It seems to be years and years and years that I've been standing on stages and I've been talking about the global challenges and it's talk. I talk, we all talk. I'm really, really desperate for something to happen and I think we all are. Something has really got to happen soon. Actually, not soon, now. So for that reason, the talk I'm going to give you this morning is not really a normal keynote. It's actually something a little bit different. I'm asking for your help. You, the people in this room, and your colleagues around the world, are, I think, exactly the people who can help me with a little project. No, what am I saying? A big project, which I'd like to launch. I haven't really talked about this project very much in public yet. I thought I'd wait until I met you this morning and tell you about it and see if I can get your help. Now, I could do this appeal for help in about five minutes, but I've actually got 23 minutes and 18 seconds, so I'll give you a bit of background to it so you can perhaps understand where my thinking has come from and how it's developed over the last 20 years. It all starts, well, it always starts with a list, a long list of all of the challenges that are facing humanity in the 21st century. And if you give me 30 seconds, I can give you 30 grand challenges, and I'm sure you can do the same. We hear them all the time. It usually starts with climate change, and then it goes on to weapons proliferation, conflict, poverty, inequality, terrorism, pandemics, human rights abuses, narco-trafficking, modern-day slavery, small arms proliferation, education, illiteracy, infant mortality. We could go on and on and on, and this is new. This is the age of the long challenge. It's never been like this before. Well, in one sense, it was like this before. It was like this at the very, very beginning. Do you remember 60 or 70,000 years ago when we were one tribe living in Africa? We were one tribe facing a single set of challenges and we worked together to face those challenges. Do you remember that? And we were good. We defeated most of those challenges, and we survived, and we prospered, and we walked out of Africa, and over the following tens of thousands of years, we covered almost the whole planet. The story of human progress since that day when we walked out of Africa, has been a story of us, the human tribe, trying to get back together again. And the amazing thing is that today, as I stand here and talk to you, we've almost achieved that aim. We are within millimeters of being a single tribe again, because we are within millimeters of all being able to talk to each other once again as if we were all sitting around the same campfire. And of course, we are once again all facing the same challenges. And the reason that we're facing those challenges this time is all our own fault. Now, for the last 20 years, as Sabine said, my day job has been advising governments around the world. And when I ask them about their challenges, what is it that's bothering you? I began to notice very, very soon after I started this work that I never heard any different answers to those challenges. I can't remember the last time one country told me about a challenge it was facing that was purely 100% domestic. Every challenge that every country ever tells me about is a challenge I've heard 20, 30, 40 times before from other countries. All of our problems today are thoroughly globalized. In fact, the problem with the world that we're living in at the moment is that our problems, our challenges, are more globalized than our solutions. 
This is the imbalance. Mexico can't fix drug trafficking on its own because it's bigger than Mexico, it's global. China can't fix climate change because it's bigger than China, it's global. And so forth. Europe can't fix migration because it's bigger than Europe. We have to work together if we're going to confront the challenges of the 21st century. We need cooperation and collaboration between nations as the default. But that's just the problem. It's not the default. It's never changed from that morning when the Treaty of Westphalia was signed and the nation state came into being. We are still countries of the world configured like warring, competing tribes. America first, Britain first, Guatemala first, Iceland first. We all do it all the time because that's the way we're still programmed, and it's suicidal. We have to learn to change the culture of governance worldwide from one that is fundamentally competitive to one that is fundamentally collaborative. Now, Thank you. Don't get me wrong, I don't have a problem with competition. I think competition is a very, very valuable instinct. It's a profoundly rooted part of human nature. We all have it inside us, and it's good, it's powerful. It has, of course, lifted billions of people out, out of poverty over the last century. Competition becomes a problem only when it is the only altar at which we worship, and that has been the story for the last 80 years. Competition only makes sense when it is wisely mixed with cooperation and collaboration. Industry has known this for decades. Academia has known this for decades. Universities are almost the perfect example of organizations that compete and collaborate. It's about time that countries learned a lesson from universities and discovered that you can do both of those, and it works. Now, I mentioned just now the phrase, America first. But let me be clear, I don't have a problem at all with President Trump's statement of America first. It seems to me to be a statement of the bleeding obvious. If you're the president of a country and you've been elected to lead them, of course you put that country first. But what I find depressing about the insinuation of many populist leaders today is the assumption that you coming first means everybody else has to come last. And this is just plainly not the case. So right now, if we look at those global challenges... <laughs> you're adorable. <laughs> if we look at those global challenges, it's very, very easy to get extremely disheartened, extremely depressed. I actually sometimes wonder, in some of the countries that are going through a great deal of misery and turbulence at the moment, whether in fact the entire population isn't suffering from some mild, persistent form of clinical depression. I'm not kidding, it really does feel that way, doesn't it? Every day, you turn on the TV or you open your browser, hardly daring to see what's happened next. And it's very, very easy to get overwhelmed by this. But I've thought about it, and I've thought about it, and I've talked about it, and I've talked about it. And I've come to the conclusion that you can actually simplify it down to two problems and two solutions. So bear with me, this is simplistic. Some people even call it naive, but I'm always a little bit anxious about that word naive. There is a sort of a tradition, actually a modern habit, of assuming that anything that is simple plus hopeful must be naive. Sometimes that's true, but not always. Sometimes simple plus hopeful is just what we need. And I hope I'm right about that. So the two problems that humanity is facing at the moment, forget the list of 30 grand challenges, forget the SDGs for a moment, those are all just symptoms of two underlying problems. One the way that countries behave to the way that people behave. Every single one of those global challenges has got one thing in common. It's our fault. We've done it, people. And countries 
And the way that they behave together are one of the main reasons why we're not making more progress in resolving those challenges. The behavior of people is one of the main reasons why they don't go away, why they persist, and why we keep on developing new ones. So we're never going to make any progress. We're never going to be able to move forward unless we can change, as I said before, the way that countries behave, and as I'm going to say now, the way that people behave. So changing the way that countries behave is a big, long story. It's to do, as I said, with the culture of governance. It's to do with the way that we elect our politicians around the world. It's to do with the way that we as citizens behave and the degree to which we understand or take the trouble to understand the issues that our politicians are dealing with. It's to do with education, of course, because everything's to do with education. I've spent the last 20 years trying, kind of stupidly, on my own to change the way that countries behave. I have not succeeded. In fact, after doing this government advisory, trying to help countries to engage more productively and more collaboratively with the international community, and proving to them that this actually makes better policy than thinking only of yourself, proving to them that it's possible and effective to harmonize your domestic and your international responsibilities, I realized after my 54th country that before I saw an actual change in the culture of governance, I was going to be 962, and it would be a little bit late for me, even if it wasn't too late for everybody else. So I began to think to myself, well, maybe what we actually need here is what we call a pincer action, like a pair of scissors. If I, and I hope many other people, and I'm working on that too, are giving private advice to governments and showing to them, helping them to understand how collaborating more is actually more competitive behavior, will improve their economies, will improve their societies and their cultures. If we've also got those politicians, voters, or in the cases where they're not democratic, at least the people who don't kick them out of power, saying the same things, then maybe things really could start to change. But I said that every problem was fundamentally a problem of human behavior. And if people are the problem, then people are the solution. Why do people behave the way they behave? Well, the simplest possible answer is because that's the way that they've been educated. And one of the reasons why things are really not looking better any quicker is because we still bring up our children in the way that we brought them up before our problems became globalized. We're still teaching them and training them to expect to live in a closed domestic society. We're not yet bringing them up to be global citizens. We're not yet bringing them up to understand the interconnectedness and the interdependency of the human race and of the planet that we all live on. This is the thing that's got to change. It's very, very difficult to change the behavior of adults. And this is a lesson that Greta Thunberg is discovering this week. She's been discovering it all her young life. You take an adult and you shake them, but they will not change because by the time you've reached the age of 30, you've already decided everything. It's so, so hard to change the behavior of grown-ups, but kids, ha, huh, it's easy. The Jesuits, the Christian sect, used to say in their schools, give me the boy and I will give you the man. They hadn't invented women when they made up that uh, quote. <laughs> There's something very profoundly true and potentially very sinister, of course, in that statement. But let's look at the profound truth of it. The way that we bring up our children is, of course, the shape of the world tomorrow. Now, this is kind of so obvious, and particularly with you guys, I feel a little bit ashamed about pointing it out, because it is, as Homer Simpson would say, a little bit dull. And in fact, all over the world, there are thousands, maybe more, maybe tens of thousands, of educational projects which are trying very hard, some of them with enormous success, to bring up a new generation of children that instead of running away from the world's challenges, will run towards them. And that's what we need. And there are thousands of these projects. The problem is that they're too many. They're too small, they're not sufficiently ambitious, most of them, and they're very local, and they tend to be just one subject. 
You've got subnational regions of Canada teaching children about climate change. You've got individual schools or groups of schools in sub-Saharan Africa teaching children about tolerance. And that's great, and we know it works, because every time somebody tries an experiment like that, we can see the potential and very often even the reality of it actually making a big difference for those tiny, tiny numbers. But as I said right at the beginning, I'm sick of talking. And one of the things that's really, really dawning on all of us suddenly, right now, almost this week, is that we have reached a crisis point. The talking has got to be added on to some action right now and immediately. So here's my suggestion and here's what I'd like your help with. What I think we need now is we need to embrace all of those educational projects around the world. We need to accept and understand that basically what they're trying to do is to create a better generation. And we need to pull them together and we need to turn them into a single global compact. The idea occurred to me just a few months ago, and for various reasons, I was looking at the websites of a lot of NGOs and charities. And I began to notice the same phrase occurring over and over again on these websites, almost in the same words every time. It said something like, and we must leave the world in a better state for our children. And I found myself thinking, that is so arrogant. Isn't it? The idea that you can take some gigantic systemic crisis like climate change, which has taken the omissions and commissions of billions of people, centuries, to perpetrate, and you're going to fix it before you check out? Sometimes, you know, believe it or not, we're just a little bit too impatient. Sometimes we fail to understand the speed at which humanity really does operate. It's slower than we would like. And at the moment, it might even be slower than we need. But we must hold our nerve because this is going to take a generation. It will take a generation because that's exactly the time frame that's required to replace the psychological, cultural and social DNA that has caused all the global challenges. So what I'm suggesting is this, a project which I'm calling the Good Generation. And the idea behind the Good Generation is very simply that we start off with a gigantic online global conversation. We try and include as many people as we possibly can from all over the world, and we ask them to join this discussion about what are the virtues, or as we would say in the West, the values that can lead towards a new generation, a generation that, as I said, runs towards the challenges instead of running away from them. How do we want to raise our children and I would hope, I don't know how long this will take, but at the end of this big conversation, we'll end up with a set of virtues or values. Maybe five or six, maybe eight or ten, I don't know, probably not more than ten. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create a global compact around those educational values. Now, if anybody thinks that that's difficult, they're right. If anybody thinks it's impossible, they're wrong, because we've done it before. And if anybody thinks that creating a global accord on values as sensitive as the way that we bring up our children is too difficult because of cultural differences, because of linguistic and religious and geographical and economic differences, take a look at a document called the UN Charter on Human Rights. It's a very, very moving document and it's a demonstration, indeed, as is the UN Charter itself, that when humanity really does need to get together, those cultural differences aren't an obstacle for very long. Trust me, I'm an anthropologist. If we really need to get together and we really need to agree on these things, we can do it. It's not rocket science. In fact, one of the problems in the world today, if you ask me, is that we have a tendency to exaggerate our differences. Fundamentally, this is pretty straightforward and pretty practical. We've got to stop messing up the planet and we've got to stop fighting each other. You can't get more simple than that. And I've never come across a half-decent culture or religion that doesn't agree with those fundamental principles. So once we've then collected all of these values together and we've designed this global compact, then I have a sort of a vision in my mind that we might get perhaps 100, perhaps 200 ministers of education from all over the world to meet together and sign this compact. For some reason, which I won't go into now, in my mind it's in Venice. I sort of see these hundred ministers of education 
coming into St. Mark's Square in gondolas. Well, they wouldn't go into the square, they'd come to the Grand Canal in gondolas and they'd walk through and they'd meet at the Procuratie Vecchie and they would sign this global compact. And it would be live streamed all over the world. And the 10% of people, minimum 10% of the people, who my research tells me think of themselves as global citizens first and citizens of their own nation second will suddenly feel an unfamiliar sensation in their breast, a feeling of hope. Maybe we're not all going to hell in a handbasket. Maybe we are moving forwards. Maybe we can move forwards. Maybe we just have to hold our nerve for one generation, but we can do it. So that's the little project. Don't do that. Save it till the end. <laughs> I'm running out of time. So that's the project. Now, here's why I wanted to tell you about it. Because obviously, it is pretty ambitious. And obviously, if I have, and if anybody who's working with me on this shares that determination to make it not talk but action, to make it actually happen, then I'm going to need some help. Right now, it is just me. And I need a big, powerful partner to help me push this through and to make sure that it happens and happens well and happens for good. And I thought to myself, the ideal partner is probably the world's universities. Because universities are just perfect. They're centers of learning. They're international. They're in every city and many towns all over the world. People in universities, because they're scholars and because they're researchers, will understand, and a great many of them will probably share these fundamental beliefs. They're connected. The universities of the world are a sort of new diplomatic network which has never really been lit up yet. But it could and it should. Universities understand education, and this is all about education. They understand it technically, they understand it personally, because that's how they got there. Universities can form the bridge between governments and children. Universities can help understand exactly how we're going to teach these children to be the new generation that we so badly need. I'm not suggesting, by the way, that we should go around the world teaching climate change or teaching tolerance, because that has been tried before and it doesn't always work. My own experience of education is that if you want to change people's behavior in a positive way, you have to do it with them being aware of it, they, you need their permission, you can't just inject them with something without them realizing it. And they have to be a participant, a discussant in the process. And it's much better if you're teaching them something that is inherently useful at the same time. So, for example, if you want to teach tolerance, don't teach tolerance, teach cultural anthropology. I know this myself because I tried it on my own children when they were about six. If you teach cultural anthropology to six-year-olds, A, it's a subject they absolutely love. And B, more importantly, they start to take a scientific pride in understanding cultural difference. And if you take a scientific pride in understanding cultural difference, you are incapable of tolerance, intolerance. You are incapable of ignorance or racism. It's just not in your being because your scientific pride rebels against it. So this is the kind of approach. If we want to cure climate change, we don't teach kids about climate change. We teach them about meteorology or oceanography. So maybe they'll switch off the damn light when they leave the bedroom. That's the way that it works. We come at it sideways. So that's really pretty much everything I wanted to tell you. The Good Generation is a project that I want to launch as soon as possible. And what I wanted to do today, because I had the honor and the privilege of being able to speak to you about it first, I wanted to ask you, will you help? And if you do want to help, let's talk about it. Let's have a conversation. I suggest Twitter. I think Twitter's really good for these kinds of things. Of course, you can also email me if you want. If you want to email me directly, then I'd be absolutely thrilled. Simon at good.country. Simon at good.country. I'd love to hear from you, and I will answer the email. If everybody, 6,000 people, send me an email on the same day, it might take a week or two for me to answer, but I will answer. But I think more useful for the general open conversation so we can all know what each other is saying, Let's use Twitter, and let's use the hashtag good generation, hashtag good generation, and let's discuss a few things. Let's do a trial run of that big global discussion about the values and the virtues that would underpin this. If you've got suggestions about what those values or virtues should be, if you know about work that's already been done in this area, 
Let's tweet about it, let's discuss it, and see how it goes. I want to get a sense of how many people within this group, within this global community, are keen to participate. I want to talk to you about how it could work at the individual level of your university. There's a whole other conversation there about what makes a good university, like a good country, one that harmonizes its internal responsibilities with the responsibilities of the world around it, and that's part of the motivation for getting involved. Let's discuss that, and if we find that there is a willingness amongst a reasonable number of people and institutions to do this together, then for heaven's sake, let's do it together. Thank you.